Well, thanks so much. Welcome back, everybody, from lunch. Hopefully you didn't get too wet if you were walking around outside in our lovely Seattle weather. Welcome to Seattle. Um, I, I, full disclosure, I love the topic of diverticulitis. It's one of the classic examples of almost everything we were taught in medical school and residency turned out to be wrong, and we are continually inventing this subject. So my task in the next couple of minutes is to talk about this idea of the burden of diverticulitis and to really cement for all of you why this is such a great area for us to be thinking about, thinking about innovations in therapy, and really rethinking our entire approach to the field. So I have no disclosures to make other than that. And in case you want to, the cheat sheet, this is, I'm going to leave you with three take-home points by the end of this talk. The first is that diverticulitis definitely is occurring more frequently in society, even accounting for the aging of the population. That, uh, that with the, this profound, I'll use this one instead, yeah. That, um, that the U.S. is experiencing actually what I would call an epidemic not of diverticulitis, but of diverticulitis treatment that we are all responsible for. We're going to talk about that. And the third is that episode counting does def definitely does not equal burden of disease. And when we start thinking about the burden of disease for diverticulitis, it's not going to be about episodes. So if you want to take the next 15 minutes and go do whatever you want to do, I'll come back at the end. This is what I'm going to take home with, but we'll fill in the details in between if you want to watch. So here's the bad news for all of us with graying hair or losing our hair. By age 65, half of us are going to have diverticula. That's the bottom line. We know this from autopsy studies. We know this from colonoscopy studies. And this is an elegant study done by Patanasi that came out two years ago that compiled all of the data from every country in the world where there's been either autopsy or colonoscopy data. And in red are the countries that have 50% uh, or more with diverticula by this age. And then you see the countries that have less of it. There's a lot of red in westernized countries, other countries that have yet to have it studied. But you get the idea that there's a lot of diverticula. But of course, we know that diverticula don't equal diverticulitis. Here's the concern, though. Between 2010, just a couple years ago, and 2050, look at the amount of people that are going to be in the age 60 to 75-year-old group. It's going to grow by two-thirds. The percentage of people in the greater than 75-year-old group growing 158%. The silver tsunami that you all have heard about is undoubtedly going to be driving the number of people with diverticula. But as I said, diverticula doesn't equal diverticulitis. What proportion of older people with diverticula will really be burdened by diverticulitis? And pretty much everything we ever learned about this fact right here, just throw it out the window. We really don't know the proportion of people with diverticula that will be burdened by diverticulitis, largely because the only way we know diverticulitis is by what we do to treat it. So you know the old adage, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, did the tree really fall kind of thing. We only understand the burden of diverticulitis, the way we count it, the way we measure it, is how we treat it, how everybody in this room treats it. And if in the United States we treat diverticulitis, let's say, very differently than everywhere else in the world, we are going to look like we have a lot more diverticulitis than they do in the rest of the world. And that's going to be one of the things I'm going to elaborate. To look at the way we can count the burden of diverticulitis, we look at inpatient billing claims mostly, or you know, med maybe medical records. But if you want to look at it in a county level, a state level, a national level, we use administrative claims data. Basically, did a bill get put into an insurance company for the treatment of diverticulitis? And if you look at this, this is by Etzioni, who may be in the audience, I don't, I don't see him. But you know, if you look at the top line, this is the number of hospital admissions nationwide in the United States over a, just a, just a seven year period. And you see that top line going up and up and up. The number of admissions for diverticulitis absolutely is increasing. And by the way, you could draw the same picture in England and Australia. Diverticulitis admissions have increased over time. And the hospitalization for diverticulitis, you know there are two reasons for it, either because of complicated disease or where you have an abscess or some perforation or peritonitis where you need surgery urgently, or the uncomplicated stuff. But here's where it gets tricky, right? Because antibiotics used to be given in hospital all the time. But how many of you really hospitalize patients for diverticulitis now? Very unusual. It's mostly treated with outpatient care. And so this idea that we measure it by elective surgery is one of the ways we could track the sort of burden of diverticulitis. But so much of the care is happening as outpatient, we've really lost our ability to count diverticulitis episodes. Notwithstanding what I just said, about 300,000 hospitalizations each year, making it one of the top five most common GI diagnoses for sure, and about a $3 billion cost, of which 70% of it's related to the hospital. But here's the crazy part. 
In Washington State, where we track uh, the epidemiology of surgical disease a lot, this is what the, the incidence of elective colectomy for diverticulitis has looked like between 1987 and uh, the numbers run out to 2014, but stay about the same. That's amazing, right? That's a three-fold increase in the incidence of elective colectomy for diverticulitis. So let me say that again. On the x-axis is the year. On the y-axis is the adjusted rate, keeping age and sex standardized per 100,000 people. Look at that tremendous growth in the burden of diverticulitis. This epidemic is of colectomy, not of diverticulitis, of, 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 of colectomy for diverticulitis. Now, Etzioni actually looked at this too. Just you think that Washington State's not some crazy state where we just take out everybody's colons. The bottom line, the blue line there, is Etzioni's work looking nationally at the national inpatient sample. He found very similar incidents per 100,000 people. This is all of our burden. We are all doing this to our patients. We have driven an epidemic in colectomy. This number increased 38% over the seven years that he looked at it. And I just want to show you, this is what the incidence rate is in England. Very, very hard to find cross-national incidence of surgery data, but when you dig down to it, that is the incidence, about three and a half per 100,000 versus almost 25 per 100,000 in the United States. We are doing something different. This is driving the experience of diverticulitis for our patients in the United States. So in Washington State, we really wanted to understand what is driving all of this burden of diverticulitis, so to speak. A through L on the x-axis, these are different counties in Washington state. Why is that same uh, rate or incidence of, of uh, colon resection for diverticulitis? These are by county. These are two counties that sit right next to each other. They're both equally populous. They both have tons of surgeons, trust me. Look at the differential and how we decide when we should take out somebody's colon. This is the kind of confusion that the surgical community has about the way to treat diverticulitis. And this is why sessions like this are so important. Well, here's the kicker though. Why do surgeons take out so many colons? Well, because we were all taught that it can prevent you from having emergency colectomy. Look at the sad truth. The red line here is the same figure that I showed you before, but it shows that all of that increased use of elective colectomy on the top line it hasn't changed the incidence of non-elective or emergency colectomy for diverticulitis at all. And I'll, I'll be conditioned by saying all of this is for diverticulitis. I know it just says colectomy, but this is colectomy for diverticulitis. And where are the Brits, just to look at it? The Brits are down here. By the way, this rate of non-elective colectomy in England is actually higher than their rate of elective colectomy in England. Just to give you an idea of how much in the United States we've driven an epidemic of not diverticulitis, but of surgical treatment for diverticulitis. And by the way, even in England, that's one and a half times higher than Australia, which is another story altogether. So back to England. So in England, this is the incidence data that they have, looking at their national health system data. Top line suggests that it's the number of total patients with what they call diverticular disease. And it looks like it's gone up like crazy. But the way it's gone up is because of that middle line, which is people getting colonoscopy for diverticular disease, something we don't do too much of here. And the bottom line, is the number of people who are actually inpatients. So we are doing something different in the United States. Our curve is nothing like that bottom curve in England. And what I'd argue is that we have a crazy increase in the way surgeons have approached diverticulitis. Just to get one more view of it to show you how crazy the United States is in general, when I want to understand the epidemiology of disease and I look at it, I go to the panacea, the, the perfect place for healthcare in America, Olmstead County, where there's one health system that takes care of the whole community. It's a fairly tight, closed community. They have perfect health records and have had it since 1980. They have noticed an increased incidence of diverticulitis in their community, measured by outpatient and inpatient and really carefully selected claims. Uh, and the proportion of people having surgery in that community really has not changed at all during, the, during this era, 1980 to 2007. I will say that with the same proportion having surgery, the incidence of elective collecting probably even went up there a little bit, but nothing like what you see in sort of the normal fee-for-service world of surgery. This is something we have to own. Why, why this has happened? I mean, a lot of people have theories about this. You know, the time that you had the steepest increase in elective colectomy for, in the United States happened to be the time that laparoscopic surgery was taking off, but it was not allowed to be done in anybody but uh, patients who didn't. I'm sorry, it was, it was sort of uh, the, the, the cancer population was not a population we were doing laparoscopic surgery on. There was a lot of right-sided diverticulitis that came up in that era. Just to give you a, these are suspicions of why we had this epidemic of diverticulitis surgery. 
All right, maybe we were right though. Maybe all this preventative surgery, take out the colon, is worth a pound of cure. So the question is, is all this elective resection, did it get us a lower rate of recurrence? Another bird way to you'd measure the burden of disease. So for that, you need outpatient data. We, uh, you know, there are about one and a half to three million people each year who have outpatient visits for diverticulitis. We like this market scan database. It's basically uh, insurance claims that have outpatient and inpatient, but also have uh, antibiotics data. And what we found here is on the top line, this is the, 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 the likelihood that you'll have a recurrence after an elective colectomy for diverticulitis. That's the black line. There, you know, there is a recurrence rate after we take out somebody's sigmoid colon for diverticulitis. And it looks like about 15% in five years, a number that we've heard before. And it dramatically is it's better to get your colon out if you want to prevent recurrence. There's an 83% lower risk of recurrence if you get your colon out than if you don't get your colon out. So big surprise, if you take out that segment, you have less likelihood of recurrence. But you know, you see it's not an not a absence of recurrence either. And so this last bit is all this colectomy necessary on any level. And this is what I'd say to that. You have to use medical record data for that. In Washington State, we have this cool program called SCOPE, the Surgical Care and Outcomes Assessment Program. It's like uh, NISQIP, but it focused originally on just on Washington State and really focused on process of care, how we do our work, outcomes of care, of course, but it focused also on appropriateness. Was this colectomy necessary? We got all the surgeons to dictate around this sheet over here that said, why are you actually taking out Mrs. Jones's colon? And maybe we could push them to not take out Mrs. Jones's colon based on the number of episodes and push them over to sort of the quality of life business. And so this is the trend in surgeons in Washington state. The dark line is the per year uh, sort of rate of colectomy being performed just for the number of episodes of diverticulitis. And that's the direction you'd like to see, that over time we're doing less and less colectomy just for recurrent disease. I'll just wrap up with this last bit, which is that as the world has moved towards measuring quality of life, these are the, the ASKERS criteria, recommending that you only remove colons if it's a quality of life burden. We've had to really focus on that. We have the study called Debut in Washington that's bringing hospitals together to do quality of life assessments. It's been a very interesting way to ask patients about all the things that bother them, all those things on this list, everything from, from the feel like the depression and stigma to loss of control. And what we found is remarkable, that if you ask people and really ask people about how often they're having suffering from diverticulitis, a lot of people say it's between two to five or six to 10 times a year. We are doing a major study because a lot of the folks who have diverticulitis say this is why they want their colons out. The antibiotics make them feel awful. They never get better. They're in and out of the doctor's office. And so like the Dutch, which have been studying whether or not you need to do antibiotics at all or do surgery at all, we have this national network that we put together around the, uh, the antibiotics versus appendectomy study, this CODA trial. And we are trying to build on top of it uh, what we call COSMID, a comparison of surgery and best medical management for diverticulitis. And so the take home points, I'll just end with those. That's where I started. Diverticulitis is occurring more frequently, uh, even accounting for the aging of the population. And we don't know what the effect of this gigantic tsunami is going to be. The US is experiencing for sure an epidemic of diverticulitis treatment, and that we have to all own that. And it's different from other countries, and it begs the question of how necessary is all that elective surgery. And to you, that there's this difference between episode count and burden that we all have to really recognize and figure out how to assess it in our patients and how to incorporate it into our practice. The COSMID trial I mentioned and the direct trial you're going to be hearing about with Jason later is the way to sort of bring this into our practice. Just some thanks. This is a trial, a trial funded by the uh, NIDDK. This is my key collaborator at the University of Washington. You all should know Gianna Davidson. These are two fellows you're going to be hearing about because they're going to be awesome leaders in their fields, and they did a lot of the work here. And these are some of the articles that explained what I was talking about today, helped me get smarter. Hopefully that helped you all get a little bit smarter about this topic. Thank you for your time. I'm over. Thank you.